Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zoe from the Rebus community and it's wonderful to see you all here today uh, and see our guests who we're very excited to hear from. Um, we have had a bit of a break from office hours, so welcome back to those of you who were with us before the break and I hope everybody's having a wonderful summer if it is summer where you are and a wonderful not if it is not. Um, it was uh, nice for us to be able to take that break too and we're back with a great lineup of office hours for the next couple of months. Uh, excited to, to share much more with you all and to hear back from all of you too. So today we're going to be talking about adapting OER to your unique context. Uh, now this was a really tricky one to even find a title for. We kind of, we had the guests in mind before we came up with the, the subject exactly. And it's one of those wonderful things about OER is you can adapt it. And then there is also a, a, a kind of a, a slice within adaptation that we wanted to capture here and talk about. Um, and so we have a, a really fantastic group of guests here to talk about adapting across disciplines, uh, localizing content, and then also talking about translation and localization happening at the same time. Um, so as always, we are thrilled to partner with the OTN on these sessions. Uh, and so I will hand over to Karen to introduce our guests. Thanks, Zoe. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Lauritsen with the Open Textbook Network, and I'm delighted to see you all here and potentially learn more about your adaptation projects. So as Zoe mentioned, um, our guests are going to share some case studies of their open textbook translation, localization, and cross-discipline projects. And they're going to talk about practical knowledge about the process, focusing on how they define their goals and scoped adaptation projects which I know some of you in this call are also working on at this very minute. Um, we are going to start today hearing from Linda Fredrickson, who is recently retired. I just learned, so it's appropriate for me to say she is the former head of access services at Washington State University in Vancouver. After Linda, we'll hear from Carrie Cutler. She's assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Washington State University. And then after Carrie, we'll hear from Werner Westerman, Head of Civic Training Program at the Library of the National Congress in Chile. So our guests will just briefly share a little bit more about their projects for a couple minutes. And then after that, we will open it up to you for your questions so that you can drive the conversation. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Linda. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, it's still morning where I am, but good day to all of you wherever you are. Um, I guess I'll just launch right into my project. Um, I am now retired, but was an academic librarian at a state university branch campus in Washington State until very recently. Part of my job was as an education liaison librarian. So I provided instruction, uh, library instruction, library orientation to uh, education students, both in their bachelor's program and in their master's program. In that process of doing library orientations, um, which were often just sort of one hour, one shot, here's how to do library research it became obvious to me anyway that the graduate students, especially new graduate students, really didn't know how to do lit reviews. It was almost always one of the first assignments they had in their research methods classes, um, but they didn't really know how to do how to do a lit review. They'd done research papers as undergraduates, but the, um, the lit review was, is different. Um, and so, it, in talking with my colleague Sue Phelps, who is the nursing liaison librarian, she observed the same sort of um, situation in the nursing graduate programs as well. So we decided that we would try to um, create a, a library guide. They're called Lib, Lib Guides or Live Guides. It's a product that. Um, uh, libraries often host on their own servers. It's a subject um, guide for library resources. So we worked on that for a while. Um, and it was okay. It helped us get our ideas into sort of a module kind of a um, 
format, but it was very static, um, really just a link farm, which we didn't think was a very appropriate um, way to instruct. And so we moved on and tried to turn that content into a Blackboard uh, learning management system type product. And so we worked on that for a while and, and that also was helpful getting us to think about things in module form. Um, but we ran into a lot of sort of bureaucratic issues. This wasn't a class. It was, it, and so we had a hard time trying to, how, how was it going to be listed in the catalog? Who was the instructor? Well, it really wasn't any of those things. And so at about that time, I was eligible for a sabbatical and so decided to try to turn that content into uh, an open uh, OER, an open textbook. And so spent the uh, uh, six months work turning that sort of library guide, Blackboard kind of thing into uh, an open textbook um, with the help of the Rebus community. Um, since then, it has been used in some of the education and nursing graduate classes at WSU Vancouver. Uh, we had an education faculty person who used it in her class and provided us with a, um, a rubric that she uses to evaluate uh, lit reviews. Since we added that to the book, we have also heard back that people People have used the book outside of the WSU system. Um, they've used the rubric. Um, we've received some thanks for you know, providing that. So I think that's where I'll stop. Um, and you know, let me know if you have questions. Thank you, Linda. Um, everyone, uh, please make note of your questions. And we will uh, open things up after we hear from Carrie and Werner. So Carrie, over to you. Hi, uh, I'm Carrie Cutler. Uh, as uh, was indicated, I'm an assistant professor of psychology at Washington State University. I got a small uh, $4,500 affordable learning grant from my university uh, to locate and adopt an OER for my course, uh, which at the time was servicing about 250 students per year. I found a book entitled Research Methods in Psychology that somebody who I actually went to graduate school with, Rajiv, um, had created uh, and adapted a Canadian edition recently. Uh, so I contacted him directly and he shared his adaptation with me as well as another US adaptation uh, with me. And these were in press books, which my university also has. So I was really easily able to just import that textbook uh, into my own uh, press books. It was super easy. Uh, and then at that point, I was very easily able to start the editing process. Now, I'm always nervous about new technology and how things are going to work. And I thought, oh no, how's this press books good thing going to work? And it was extremely easy uh, to edit within press books. Now, I was previously using a book that I really did quite like uh, a lot, but you know, the book was $100, $150 for students. Um, and I've always had issues with published textbooks. I've always found typos, I've found grammatical errors, I've found mathematical errors, and uh, most concerningly in psychology, I found insensitive language. Uh, and despite my previous attempts to contact publishers and have them make these corrections, the corrections were never made. And three editions later, I would still see the exact same errors that I had contacted publishers about. So I just love that I could edit this book exactly how I see fit. And I wasn't at the mercy of textbook publishers to make these corrections and edits. I could do it. I ended up adding about 30% more content to the book because as good as it was, I did think that it was a bit light on some content. I thought that it was missing some important content that I taught in my course and thought that students would need a little bit of extra assistance with. 
Um, I also did a little bit of reorganization, but primarily what I did was just add to the textbook. Um, I used the textbook with great success. My students were absolutely thrilled with not having to pay for another expensive textbook. And that year, my teaching evaluations increased. I got an award from a student organization recognizing my use of OER, and I was voted best professor of the year for my university. Uh, not to mention, I saved my students about $35,000 uh, that year alone. So my efforts definitely paid off. Now, one of the previous authors who also, who Rajiv and I went to grad school with, oddly enough, three of us are on here. We all went to grad school together, even though we really did all of this independently. It's just a weird, happy coincidence. Um, anyway, his name is Dana, and he suggested that we have uh, my new adaptation of the book peer reviewed. Uh, he saw a call from the Rebus community. I applied, we were quickly approved, and then we worked with Rebus to identify peer reviewers uh, and coordinate and organize the peer review process. It took roughly a year, um, and then just this summer, Rajiv, Dana, and I got together in person in Vancouver, our old stomping grounds from grad school, uh, to go through the peer reviews collectively. Uh, we made the suggested changes along with a few other changes. Uh, we decided that we would add a glossary, uh, that we would add a proper reference section at the end, and we also added a bunch of instructor supplementary resources like slides and quiz questions, uh, laboratory um, uh, activities, and so on. And we just released the, the new fourth peer-reviewed edition of Research Methods in Psychology earlier this month. Uh, we've all been promoting the textbook on our own and also through various outlets. The Rebus community, once again, has been very helpful in uh, helping us to blast out about our new edition. Uh, we've had it added to the Open Textbook Network, and now there are actually dozens of people across the U.S. and in Canada who are using our book. And according to our records, we are currently saving students an estimated $100,000 per year. Uh, so in short, this has been an extremely fun, rewarding, and exciting project, well worth uh, the effort. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that I subsequently got a second affordable learning grant from my university to adopt another OER for another course the following summer. Uh, and this time, one of my colleagues at WSU had recently created an OER for an online section of an abnormal psychology course. And I simply worked to edit that for my classroom section, once again, putting it into press books and simply making edits. Uh, this time, instead of adding content, I worked to trim content as you know, there was just a lot in there uh, that was a little bit irrelevant to my students. Um, I also worked to remove copyrighted material and insensitive language. This was a much shorter process. I currently use this book in my abnormal psychology class that serves about 500 students per year. So now I'm saving my students approximately $50,000 a year. Uh, and once again, they voted me best professor. Great, thank you very much, Carrie. And now uh, let's hear from Werner about his projects. Hello, everyone. Is everybody here? Okay. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, first of all, <clears throat> many thanks to, to Zoe and her team, as, as well as Karen from the Open Textbook Network. Um, it's very admirable here, the work that you guys are, are training down. Um, Open education in, in my region is, is it's not yet an issue that uh, has the power that, that you guys are, uh, but you're surely showing us the way how. Doing an admirable work, I, I might say. Um, I've been following both projects and, uh, and about Rebus, I really find very brave uh, to, 
to embrace this community-driven approach, and, and, and which is an approach that gives you a lot more critical problems and complexity of how it, but we kind of know that that's the end where we want to go. So uh, looking back at the last two years, uh, you've really made some great progress, especially, you know, embracing this approach and looking at how the community platform has evolved as well as the creation demo that you showed in March. So I'm really excited. So congratulations to, to all. And uh, uh, please, Karen, give my, my, my special regards to David. Um, I, I visited uh, the, the uh, Minnesota a couple of years ago, so and, and we had a great two-year, two-day workshop uh, where they really showed us a way in, to make a pro, uh, uh, to contribute to a project that I'm going to talk in a few minutes. So, thank you for all your work, and uh, we we really need you in 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 the future and beyond. And and uh, well, I love this. Have also embracing the, the the issue about adapting. I think. When you when you look at openness in education, I think adapting is is really the core of uh, of the real value that's out in, that's inside of openness and how that that uh, that action of uh, of openness uh, in adapting it's, it's it's where we really find the benefits for for students learning and and for the the, the teachers uh, um, teaching. And, um, and and I think it's it's very core because adapting, for, especially for us in Chile, uh, it, it gives you the chance to contextualize. Um, it makes you it makes the possibility so you can reshape or you can customize the resource for a specific needs that your classroom or your students need. So that's a, that's a, I think a very core value inside of adapting as well as localizing uh, because. Uh, which is contextualizing, but in a, in, in a, a broader scope. Um, we had to make a lot of adaptions in a project with the, that we, we made in, in Rebus, trying to translate a, a, a book about citizenship. But of course, a Canadian uh, law framework is very much different from a, from our uh, legislation um, tradition and, and context. So adaption is surely a need uh, trying to tailor your, your resources. So, but, uh, so I'm going to give you some two or three projects that I've been worked, in, uh, worked on and um, trying to uh, give some different types of adapting that we have uh, um, of course, translation is one is one issue, uh, and I think it's going to be a, an issue a very important in the future because, um, as we have um, as uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence is just pushing, especially in, in in the educational sphere, we will have very soon uh, very good uh, tools to translate automatically. And I think that's going to be a tremendous uh, breakdown, especially for countries like ours, because as you as you might think, professional translating is very expensive. So we need other forms or other ways to 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 translate uh, content. And why? Because today we have an incredible critical mass of textbooks that we could just get and translate it uh, very fast. Uh, it, Ten years ago, we we did not have nearly five percent uh, of what we have now around textbooks. So we have almost many areas covered. So I think if we can speed up uh, uh, translation, it would be will be very. And I think that's going to be very soon. There's a project in Europe called Translexi. Um, I'm trying to push them to go to Spanish because they've, they, they've made the artificial tra translation for, for many languages, but Spanish not yet. So I'm trying to, uh, but I think there's going to be a lot of more translexes in, in the future very soon. So I think we're going to, we will make uh, bigger steps. But that same question I asked about 10 years ago, I'll give you a link of a, 
Uh, we did a translation with last year's students, and that really worked very well. We put we took the students uh, in the last year of uh, translating careers or uh, or majors. Um, so they had, they made this their uh, professional practice. We call it here, which is last year, just before you 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 have to do your exam, your final exam. So before graduating. So, and that worked really good. It was, we paid them a lot lower, but they had to do it anyway. So, so that was a good, and that worked very well. Uh, we worked around wiki books and of course, wikis, especially the media wiki has its issues. You have to get used to that environment. And, but I think it worked, it worked very well uh, as well as, um, as well as editing, because we, we made um, um, the physiology book uh, had a lot of images you might uh, reckon as, as a, bi a biology uh, course and, uh, and 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 all the images were in, in the commons the wiki commons which is like the repository for media projects in wikipedia and, and they had a lot of uh, editable edit editable files so that was very good because we, we could translate images very, very easily as well. So, so that was our first experience of, uh, we also had an, an interesting experience um, with another type of uh, adaption, which I would call a remixing open content. We just paid a, a person, um, we paid him to create textbooks, selecting open content already uh, available. So this person uh, made six books, uh, in biology, chemistry, physics, and we didn't pay them much. We paid him, I would say $2,000. And it was the person just, he just uh, listed all the content he needed. He just went to the, wherever he wanted to, to grab things. And he just made a book. And, um, and I thought, you know, Looking, uh, looking at remixing open content that's really available, also a way of uh, adapting uh, uh, books. So that that was uh, that was very very neat. And, and so you can find wiki in wiki commons uh, are um, there were six books that we we made with just five was with $2,000. So I found that, that we can really scale uh, with that strategy as well. Another project, um, which I am now pasting, uh, it's a paper that we um, published in IROTL. Um, it was a, this was a, an impact study. We were looking at student performance, trying to measure uh, the impact of uh, OER in it. And we did it uh, working with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, web-based platform. We work with Khan Academy, and we also worked around open textbooks. Um, and we obviously compared the the, the the performance results with people that with students that didn't they did not uh, uh, work with OER. They, they were with the traditional commercial textbooks. And, um, well, let me say that. Working with Wikibooks, yes. I'm very sorry to interrupt. Um, your audio is is breaking up a little bit. So oh, I'm I'm okay. actually going to summarize. Yeah, I'm going to summarize the three projects that I think you described, and then open it up for questions. And if you if you want to add um, any clarifying information in the chat, if I have it wrong about those three projects, please do. Um, but it's just a little bit difficult to, to track your, um, your voice in the, in the chat, right? Is it just me? Okay, it's not just on our side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, oh, Werner, I think you mentioned projects where students were translating. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think you men mentioned projects where students were translating. A uh, second project where you hired someone and paid them to adapt books, it sounds like in the in the sciences. 
And then third, an impact study um, of OER on student performance in which you worked in a web-based platform. So those, I think, are the three adaptation projects you mentioned. Um, if you would like to add anything, perhaps the chat is the best place. And again, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think um, since you're having some audio difficulty and in the interest of time, I would like to put it to the community for some questions. And thank you and Carrie and Linda for sharing your stories. So what questions do you have um, out there? Everyone for our three guests about their experience adapting open textbooks or other adaption projects, or if you would like to share information about adaptation, adaption, editing, whatever uh, verb you prefer. Um, if you'd like to share information about the projects you're working on um, and get some input about those, um, you've got a lot of people here who are, may be able to chime in with some, some thoughts. Um, while you're gathering your thoughts and your questions, which you're welcome to share in the chat or unmute, um, I'll just add something that I think is interesting about sort of Carrie's case study. So the original, original uh, research method, methods in psychology was, um, for lack of a better word, sort of an abandoned textbook. Uh, it was um, something in the library that was not being updated. And so um, when Carrie came on the scene with her collaborators, Rajiv and Dana, and said, hey, we have a third edition, now we have a fourth edition, we've been updating what was sort of an abandoned textbook record with this living textbook. So it has become the book of record now in the open textbook library, which is, is true really of any um, book that's adapted and cared for um, going into the future. We are looking for sort of people who um, want to take care of these resources. So I wanted to share that about the library. Yes, the original Voldemort books that do not permit the original author and publisher to be named. That is, that is what I speak of. Uh, I may also jump in just as, uh, as people are, are thinking through, and I wanted to go back to Linda and pick up on something that was a big part of what we worked on together um, and, and partly why I really wanted to have her here is, uh, so as, as she kind of discussed, the text was set up to serve both education and nursing students. Um, but as we were actually looking at the creation, we, we talked a lot about how to set it up for adaptation. Uh, so one of the things that she's done, which is really excellent, is that all of the examples in either of those two disciplines are really clearly labeled uh, and they live slightly separately from the, the kind of more um, generic content that applies in lots of different contexts. Do, do you maybe want to talk about that aspect of it a little, Linda? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and I do want to say something too about the, the value of, of peer review um, in the Rebus community. That's really what drove us towards these, you know, be more specific, be more specific um, and, you know, clearly label it. I mean, it was the peer reviewers that really pointed that out. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess I would say, it was for me anyway, as, as you know, someone who's trying to adapt sort of PowerPoint slides into a book, um, takes a lot longer than you think it will. And it really was helpful to have both Zoe and um, Aperva, you know, just checking in really, really regularly, you know, is there anything we can help you with? Is there, you know, are you stuck? What, what do you need? Um, those were all really valuable things. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, um, the reaction to the book then once it was made available really speaks to, to that peer review, to the, you know, to this, the specificity um, of the examples and that kind of thing that I, that I think that's why it has been accepted um, as it has been. So, so thank you, Rebus. Thank you, and I swear this is not a paid ad, but appreciate the, the kind words. Um, and we also, uh, Linda, I'm not sure if you will have seen, uh, just this week we um, found out that uh, your text has been adapted for social work uh, as part of a social work research, research methods text. Um, from, uh, and we'll find a, a link of that to share as well, so people can check it out too and see how it does work moving through the different disciplines. Great. Okay, so I think we have uh, some questions in 
chat coming in. Thank you, everyone. I see the first one here from Rachel, uh, saying that she works in a community college and is wondering how best to support instructors in creating OER who often don't have extra time or funding to do so. Um, would any of our guests or anybody else on the, on the call like to jump in on that question? Well, I, I guess I'll, I'll get, this is Linda, I guess I'll give a plug for, for the librarians. Um, librarians look for content all day, every day. They can help because th that is one of the most time consuming parts of, of the creation is finding openly licensed images, content, infographics all that um, and uh, your local your librarian can help with that I just wanted to add that I think that any level of financial compensation that can be provided in the form of a grant is um, extremely motivating and useful to many um, uh, faculty especially who might have unpaid summers off uh, it provides a way for them to earn a, a little bit of money on this side while continuing to do um, good work. And Rachel, um, <clears throat> may I jump in? Sure. Hopefully this uh, can be heard uh, okay. So I think one, one very exciting thing to, to, to look for support in a creation or an adaptation of a textbook is bringing in support from the students. Uh, they, this is something we, we very saw in, in, in the project we did last year. Um, when you get students excited about contributing to your textbook, it, they, they, very, they get very engaged, they, they get very compromised with the with uh, with their issue very much compromised than just you know you know you having tests in, in, in your courses so I think just that brings just a, a, a very strong uh, open pedagogy and strategy to uh, to have a, an incredible learning experience and also you know contributing to to a, enhancing the your textbook uh, year after year I think. The people from Libre Text in, in California, Davis, you know, Del, Delmars, and it's a very good example about that. And, and I think that, that should, we should scale that that way of uh, adapting and creating textbooks. I'll add too, I think, for his uh, translation project that he spoke about is a good example too. Um, he actually went outside of you know traditional institutional funding channels and found funding via uh, I think I believe it was through the U.S. Embassy, wasn't it, Verna? That if and that was because it was a translation project which was of particular interest. So I think there are um, uh, different kinds of projects. It won't be true of all of them, but they, they may be something that clicks with a different kind of funding agency that you wouldn't necessarily think of to start. Um, so maybe if you don't have funding through an institution that they could look for something that's discipline specific or uh, some other kind of unique angle on the project that could um, resonate with a different kind of funder. Oh yeah, well, you, you guys know that funding is a, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's like a permanent concern and, and you just have to go where the money is and try to get it from wherever. So you, you should have the, the, the same challenges. Um, and, and, and especially for, for me, you know, nobody's a prophet in his own soil. And I can say myself, I've been a very unsuccessful advocator but um, we've made some progress um, just trying to especially adapt your ways to, to look for the funding. Uh, I think there's a lot of adapting <laughs> in yourself to, to go and get the money you need. I'll highlight some of the um, things that Rajiv has shared in the chat as well. Um, so some of his tips are to look at reusing, adapting, and remixing OER before starting with creation. And then a second tip is to collaborate across institutions within the same discipline and that the affordances of open, of course, allow a lot more collaboration than the traditional publishing process. Um, 
I wonder too uh, if others would like to share some um, open pedagogy ideas that they're working on. Um, Werner mentioned working with students on adaptation. I know there are some of you out there who are thinking about these types of projects. So if you would like to float your ideas and get some feedback, um, no one will hold you to it a year from now if it doesn't go exactly as planned. Since you put that in, I'll, I'll, I'll share it. Thank I'm you, Joe. <laughs> from Muskingum University up in Ohio. And uh, this fall, my senior seminar students will be working on an adaptation of a uh, macroeconomics principles book that is written for an American audience. Uh, we want to adapt it for a Eurozone audience, uh, which at, at one level seems pretty straightforward. Take out the Fed, put in the Euro European Central Bank, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We plan to use press books. Uh, no one at Muskingum knows anything about press books. So in two weeks, no matter how far up the learning curve I get, I'll be the campus expert, I suppose, even though I may not know much more than press books exist. Uh, but I did have a question. Uh, is it easy to create an index with press books or the, the table of contents and the glossary and all that? I can have a go at that and I'll declare myself the former product manager at Pressbooks uh, and we do still share an office with them here. Um, so on that list of things, the table of contents is very easy. That's done automatically from your list of chapters that you create. Index and glossary aren't quite as straightforward. They aren't as automated. Um, they're getting better uh, and, and they're looking at some tools and actually somebody may have, have more recent experience with creating a, a glossary uh, in um, in Pressbooks. Uh, so it's not automated. It's very much possible, but it takes a little more manual work than is ideal. Um, and uh, I can follow up. I'll do a little digging to see if I'm, if my info is a little out of date and there might be something uh, better than there was when I was last looking at it. We, we added a glossary to the fourth edition. Uh, Rajiv took that on, which was very nice. He actually just uh, got a student uh, to go through our text and uh, create that glossary for us in just a few days actually um, and so it was easy in that sense um, Rajiv is is around here uh, oh he says the student was paid thank you Rajiv uh, for for financially supporting that student <laughs> um, so uh, but he he might have a bit more of a sense of, of what was involved there um, but yes that was very effective. And again, it's always wonderful to involve the students. Um, and on that note of involving students in these projects, the other thing that I have done with both textbooks is each semester I have them create uh, questions for a study guide that I've had my teaching assistants then compile uh, into sort of test bank slash study guides um, for students. And so that's a really nice way of involving them in the process of creating supplementary resources as well. All right, Joe, we look forward to uh, checking in on your project. Um, related to the Pressbooks question, Rajiv posted one in the chat about uh, translation and the availability of fonts in Pressbooks for languages other than English. For example, he was working with an instructor on a workbook for introductory Punjabi. We had to put a request on GitHub for the open source community to add an open font for Punjabi. Is there any work happening to make this easier for OER in different languages? Zoe, I don't know if you have any um, inside scoop on Pressbooks. Yeah, again, I, I haven't been um, closely working on this for, for a little while. Uh, the, how it was, um, and my, my kind of experience of fonts is that the web support is really extensive um, and it's when you get into PDF and ebook uh, that you need to have dedicated fonts for it. And that's obviously, that's one of the big powers of Pressbooks is you do have the many formats, so students have options. Um, and uh, more and more, there are a lot of Google open source fonts that are supporting the um, different scripts and those are easy to add in. 
uh, to press books typically on request. So that's kind of where I think there isn't a, um, you know, a, a set list that they've been able to put in, but the requests, at least, uh, you know, as I understand them, can happen very quickly to make that available. Um, in terms of making that easier, uh, I, I think there are a lot of moving parts to it of the availability of the fonts as open, as open fonts, as well as actually um, getting them into the product where they're needed. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, my experience of it. Aparva, do you have anything to add? I know you worked with that a little bit when you were at First Books too. No, I think uh, previously when we had run into requests like this, the issue was always that the, font, the fonts were paid or licensed in a way that you had to pay a lot of money to make sure they worked in PDF, mm -hmm. EPUB, but we have seen more and more that uh, people are coming up with open fonts. So it's putting in the request, uh, as long as the fonts are available and openly licensed, it's easy to put them into mm -hmm. press books. I wish I could have a better resource to point you all to, but I'm afraid that's all I got. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jonathan in the chat. The font discussion is a little weird to me. I work in the Linux world and there are hundreds more of fonts which I've installed on my machine for no cost. And when I look at things in PDF or a browser or wherever, it seems to always work. Maybe it's just that we're not working in the same worlds. <laughs> it could be, and I do know also there's a difference between the, the personal use and, you know, Pressbooks being a commercial product does have other kinds of restrictions on, on what what the licenses they can leverage, but I also, I don't know Linux at all, so I, I, mm -hmm. it might just be that we're missing something massive, and uh, if you can find it, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Karen, this is Rajiv. I have a, a question, if it's okay. Sure. Um, so I think one thing that we've dealt with differently over the years with adaptations, one with the Canadian edition originally of the research methods text that preceded uh, Carrie's work, um, was we localized it for the Canadian context, of course, with laws for human ethics and, and the rest. Um, but in another case, uh, social psychology, another one of these Voldemort books, uh, we deliberately went to write an international edition. So we were deliberately looking for examples and statistics from around the world. And this is part of, we've been sort of trying to find different ways to deal with the reusability paradox of like, you know, the more you localize, the less universally it can be uh, applicable and vice versa. I'm just curious about how folks have approached that or how people have sort of thought about that critically as, you, as you're working on adaptation projects. What a great question, Rajiv. So any thoughts on, you know, as we localize and make even more specific, how are we sort of moving away from being more inclusive and um, potentially reaching a broader audience with the resources, if I encapsulated that question accurately, Rajiv? Anyone want to throw something out there? Maybe we haven't thought about it before, but we're thinking about it now? I'm still thinking about it now. I think that's a, a really excellent uh, thought to, to consider. Um, how we've gone about thinking about this has tended to be like, okay, think as you're creating content, how can you structure it so that it is easy to move blocks in and out so that the, you know, the stuff that's applicable everywhere is really clearly delineated from the things that are, are context specific or, or you know, jurisdiction specific is in the case that you're talking about laws and things like that. Um, but that obviously introduces work to, to then localize it, to then do that work of, of moving the pieces in and out, um, which as you say is actually is, is not the only way to go about this, that there's a different approach to creation that's actually uh, making it as universally or, or as broadly uh, kind of um, inclusive as possible. You've really, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking and thinking. <laughs> but it's a different approach to what we have taken so far um, in, in the kinds of, in these projects that we've worked on. Yeah, it, it's a tough question for an author. You know, I mean, they, you want to make it as general as possible. So as, as wide an audience can use it, but you need to be specific because otherwise it's like, it, it's too, it's too broad. Um, so that, that is tough. Hi, 
I think um, you can. I think I, I think that the, the that the reasoning of the question is it's related of uh, it's it's like thinking that something very specific is not going to be um, so inclusive. I I I, I think I uh, I would not think it's a trade off. Two opposites that just just fighting against each other. I think we're 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 starting just. Know how to learning how to think globally, but to act locally. And 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 I think obviously offering is very different from using the, the resource. And and uh, and I very much think that going very specific and and and, and expanding and going it's just part of all this adaption and, and trend and and i think that's the magic around op openness it, it kind of just something can happen and you don't really know where it's going to end and, and and how it's going to grow in the future or if not it may just stay there forever um but i think that's the magic of openness that's what that's the, the real challenge we need to i would not think it's a trade off and I would think that it's something that we need to think. We all we need to think globally, but we need to act very specifically in, in our specific content and context and needs. Yeah, and this um, reality that we don't necessarily have to choose, like Rajiv mentioned, using a modular approach, as Zoe said, I think too, like visually calling out um, certain parts that may be more localized, alternating theory and application with the latter being contextualized. It seems like there's um, potential to sort of try and try and balance things with, as Werner said, this sort of exciting reality that you can always change it. And um, uh, I will also highlight jo uh, Lee's Question to Joe, uh, which is related. Uh, Joe mentioned he was localizing an American-made macroeconomics book in Ohio for an EU audience, and whether it's difficult to localize that when you're not in the place you're localizing to, um, and if so, what are the challenges? And of course, this project hasn't happened yet, but Joe's reply, um, that's one of the things I want students to experience, finding as well as understanding why the Eurozone approach is different as well as familiarizing themselves with the institutions. They won't be completely at ease with the zone, but they should come away with a much better understanding or that's the hope. So I think it'll be fun to follow up, even though I said earlier, we wouldn't necessarily follow up and hold you to it. We at least are gonna to have to ask how this goes. Maybe I just say one last thing related to the previous issue is that, um, The Libre Text project has showed us that you can have a textbook that's like the core content of, of the course, but there's an incredible amount of possibilities creating ancillary material around that textbook. So I think you can have a very general approach with the core content, but then you can just make things just explode uh, in, in possibilities. In, in, in the Libertex project, it's really amazing. Each textbook just has a lot more ancillary material now than the textbook itself. So you can get students adapting course year after year, and, and obviously the delivery of the content is going to stay the same. It, it doesn't need to change. But you can create a lot of things around, and, and that's, that's it's not thinking a textbook as like a, a resource. It's thinking a textbook as a context, like an environment. You, you can do a lot more things. Then. And and I'll add quickly to Werner's comment. Um, as you or your students create these ancillary materials that are so in demand, that's also something um, that we can add to the book record in the Open Textbook Library, so we can start bringing these. Um, different assets together so that future instructors can find them uh, in one spot. Zoe? 
Uh, I was going to say I love that um, Renna's talking about, you know, the possibility and, and the magic of OER that's available because it really the story of how this translation project came together is one of my favorite, favorite moments uh, working in open education. So we sent out our newsletter announcing one of our new texts that we were supporting, a digital citizenship toolkit out of Ryerson University in, uh, in Ontario. And I think it was within about half an hour, I had an email back from Verna saying, I want to translate this. Uh, what, you know, how do we do this? What can we, um, you know, what can we do? How can we work together on this? And that turned into this project that, that um, as has talked about, has had student translators involved and, and is a really, uh, really incredible demonstration of what is possible. And that came from a project that wasn't even, you know, thinking about, okay, how do we set ourselves up for adaptation? It, it was very much, they were um, making something that was to serve their context in, in Ontario, but it's, it's gone on to have a, a, much, uh, a much broader kind of life. Um, and the other thing I, I wanted to mention too is when we set up that project, we also talked to Verna a lot about having a translation project going from Spanish into English. Um, so it was a report that had been worked on um, for, uh, and um, the title of it's escaping me at the moment now, Verna, sorry. Um, but, you know, I, I think we, that's, um, uh, didn't go through the same process with the student translators, but that idea of content moving in both directions is really critical to keep as part of this conversation. And it's not just about English language content being created, you know, within, say, the North American context where we do have, uh, you know, a lot more funding available and, uh, and whatnot. Um, uh, Leah's just showing me the title and I, I don't speak Spanish, I can't pronounce that very well, sorry. <laughs> Um, but as I say, I think, I think that's important as part of this conversation is that it's not just about moving content from, you know, the, the, the North American context into others. Uh, we should also be, be really uh, looking carefully and, and thinking about how, uh, how that flow can go in many more directions. Well, we have a few minutes remaining, so please feel free to uh, unmute and ask your question if you'd like to do it that way or post it in the chat. Jonathan um, posted, I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question or a dreamscape or all of the above, um, but he said maybe the goal of the OER community should be to make the tools for adaptations so dead easy that the default would be that we would always make bespoke versions when we use them in small or large ways and then wonders, is this asking too much because instructors are busy, they can't do that, et cetera. Anyone care to comment? Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly what I was kind of grappling with in my mind as we were talking earlier, is, is we, we, we are doing the work to try and make it really easy, but exactly as, as you point out, Jonathan, that then creates more work. Um, so it's a never ending series of, uh, of questions to tackle. Um. So, um, if I can jump in briefly, I mean, one of the things I'm envisioning is a uh, peer review is increasingly, I think a wonderful thing to integrate in, during the process, but perhaps deliberately seeking peer reviewers from a very different context. And part of the peer review is just perhaps highlighting or annotating uh, to note, well, these are the examples that, that don't really translate to this context. And so that even as an annotation, a layer that one can add in uh, if that is going to be localized for a different context, it, it really makes it much easier if you know which pieces need to be changed. Absolutely. I, I love that approach. And we've even seen cases where uh, texts have gone through peer review and one of the reviewers has said, oh, well, I could write a chapter on this topic, which I think is really missing from, um, from the selection and, and the text as it was first uh, set out. So there, there, you know, that happened in that instance at the time of creation, but that is, you know, also a way that adaptations can come out of, of a text is that they see, okay, this is, you know, the foundational text that we can use. And then as a reviewer who is also an instructor, I can take it and, and, uh, and adapt it on my own if I so choose to, as well as feeding back into the, uh, into kind of the, 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 the core text, the home text. Oh, uh, <laughs> Regina, <Redeem, absolutely. laughs> oh, yeah. Greenscape, a plugin or script that switches English spellings from US to UK Canadian. I, I would, I, if I had any uh, coding skills whatsoever, I would write that myself. <laughs> and then Joe's Just company. add use to every few words. <laughs> May I have a question 
from this. Um, I know uh, many of the people gathered here are related to to higher education institutions, but have you guys uh, have uh, looked at progress or best practices uh, with the K-12 community adapting or creating textbooks? It's one of my obsessions. Um, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm looking in this audience to see if there's something new I can catch. Or maybe the question should be, how would the challenges be different if you compare higher education from K-12? One of, one of the real challenges, at least for, from our perspective as supporting creation, is that there is a lot more uh, kind of structure and, and policy. Uh, it's, the, it's a different kind of environment to navigate, um, which is why our focus is on higher ed. But I have a couple of uh, people I might be able to introduce you to, Verna, if you want, because there, we certainly, you know, there is uh, talk between the, those working on higher ed and those on K-12. to There are enough differences that I think it's, um, uh, it, it's you can work in both, but we, we have, at least as Reba's chosen to focus on higher ed. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put you in touch with some people. Werner, there was also, and you maybe already talked to Dave about this, but there was also um, an initiative at the University of Minnesota working with K through 12. Um, and some of that work ended up in uh, this curricular module that I will put in the chat, which is more just about sort of a how to, how the instructional designers worked with, I think they were junior high-ish um, teachers in adapting an OER for their classroom. Um, but if you want to know more, um, Dave could help. All right, I think we are at our hour's end. And so I would like to thank everyone who attended today and offered their experience and questions and um, curiosities. I would also very much like to thank the Rebus community for partnering on office hours and of course our three guests. Um, Linda Fredrickson, Carrie Cutler, and Werner Westerman. We really appreciate having the three of you here today and talking about uh, your work adapting OER, so thank you. And uh, I, do we have next month's blurb? We, yes, uh, so I'll echo your thanks, Karen, to everybody here today. A really great conversation as always. Uh, looking ahead to next month, um, the topic is starting an open textbook project. Uh, and I believe Approva has just dropped a link to the details with the date and time and everything there. Um, so we hope to see you again. And in the meantime, keep an eye out. Uh, we, uh, OTN and Rebus both always have fun things going on. So keep an eye on our Twitter and newsletters for, for things. Um, we are at Rebus Community and OTN is at open underscore textbooks. Indeed. Okay. Fantastic. Well. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.